Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar on descriptive sensory analysis of sourdough wheat bread. I'm Alice Formiga of eOrganic, and this webinar will last 45 minutes to an hour, and then we'll have 30 minutes for questions. So today, I'd like to welcome back Roy DeRochers, who is the sensory practice leader of the Northwest Crops and Soils Program of University of Vermont Extension. Roy presented a very interesting webinar for us last year on grass-fed milk quality, and he's worked with many different products for about 40 years. But in this webinar, he'll be talking about his recent work on sourdough bread quality with the NIFA OREI-funded project called Value Added Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems. So welcome back, Roy, and I'm going to turn off my video and hand things over to you. Well, thank you very much, and, and I really appreciate you inviting me to do another webinar. I enjoyed it last year, and uh, along a similar theme, we're going to be focusing on descriptive sensory analysis and and its value in, in helping to understand things like the quality of products made with grains. In today's case, it'll be wheat sourdough bread and some work that we've been uh, collaborating on between ourselves and Cornell and uh, University of Wisconsin and a bunch of other groups. Um Great to see lots of people out there listening in today from around the world. I can tell you that over the 40 years that I've been doing this, I have traveled uh, throughout the world in Asia, Europe, the Middle East, North America, South America, and have hundreds of examples of how descriptive sensory has helped us uh, develop and maintain uh, products in the market that have sustained success. And now we're switching gears and I'm taking that knowledge. And one of the things I'm going to start with today is how I can uh, take that knowledge and use it to help um, farmers and producers. So I came to the University of Vermont about three years ago out of the consulting world, primarily, where we had uh, a similar job to what we have now. And that's not just to develop data for research purposes, but to actually develop data that has meaning that could provide answers. And rather than providing answers to marketing people and big global food companies, now the focus is how can we use all of the knowledge and the techniques and the methods that were developed by those big international companies to help farmers and local producers. And at UVM and in the group that I'm working with, we've been we've been trying to do that. And so we've been working with dairy farms and doing work with grass-fed milk and cheese. We've been working with uh, brewers and beer and hops and grains that go into that. And yeah, we're also working a lot in uh, in the world of grain and with grain farmers, everything from producing whiskey to producing wheat sourdough bread. And so one of the things that I want to talk about during this webinar is that descriptive sensory analysis, what it is where it comes from, and how we can take advantage of all the existing knowledge to help us in a very efficient way give answers back to all of you who are listening in on this webinar uh, to make decisions, whether they're decisions about what to farm, how to farm, what to use those products in, uh, whatever the decisions that you're making to give you information back to help you do the best possible job to be successful. So the answer to the question is, what can we do? It's two things. We can bring what's called descriptive sensory analysis into research and into problem solving for farmers and local producers. We can also uh, rely on what I call the interpretation experience because we have statistics and I'll talk about statistics and what statistics does for us in, in the data. But then we have lots and lots of years of seeing things over and over again. And how can we take advantage of that to speed things up and and find things in the data that have even more value uh, for all of you out there. What is descriptive sensory analysis? When I say that, there may be some sensory people out there. My guess is not many of you listening in have, uh, have, have had some sensory education, but in the world of doing tasting and smelling, there really are four buckets of sensory analysis, what we call sensory analysis or, or tasting. The first bucket is what is referred to as affective test or the technical term would be hedonic testing. And this is subjective type work where you go out and you give people bread or you give them whiskey or you give them uh, tortillas or you give them something made with grains and you say, how much do you like this? Which one do you like better? Uh, and maybe you ask why, but you're really getting an opinion. And that falls in the bucket of affective test. Very important. We do that. We need that data to correlate back. 
but that's not what descriptive sensory is. The second type of testing is called difference testing. This is one of the longest standing sensory tests in the world where you basically give someone a, a group of samples and see if they can pick out the odd sample. So let's say we were replacing a grain in, in, um, in a potato chip or something and we said, hey, is that going to change the flavor? We might give them two chips made with one grain, one made with a different one and see if they can tell the difference. That would be difference testing, uh, type testing and descriptive analysis is different than that. There certainly are people in the world that are called expert tasters, expert wine tasters, expert cheese tasters, expert uh, beef. You know, usually they work for government agencies. These are people that are highly knowledgeable, usually have their own terminology um, their own opinions about things. Expert tasters tend to combine objective testing with subjective knowledge. So it's not always instrumental. It's always got a little bit of a certain perspective from the experts um, world and, and their perspective. And then there's a fourth bucket. And this is the one that we're going to talk about in the webinar that we're using for projects like with the with this winter wheat sourdough bread uh, work that's been going on, and it's called descriptive sensory analysis or descriptive analysis. This is where we create a human instrument. So rather than getting subjective information like in the hedonic testing and saying what you like and don't like, what's good and bad, rather than just saying, do you see a difference? Rather than asking an expert, well, what do you think about this? What we're doing is we're training people to be highly, highly precise and accurate instruments to simply describe the sensory experience in objective terms. So you see a quick little result here, a flavor profile of some bread, which says, here are the things that we taste, here's how strong those things are. It doesn't say whether that's good or bad. It doesn't to say yet if someone would like it or not, it's an analytical result. That's a very powerful result. Now, as we start to interpret things, we have statistics and I'll come back and forth during the course of the next half hour on that issue, but we also have lots and lots of experience. Now, in my career, I spent the first 20 years at a company called Arthur D. Little. And for people who do have an education in sensory, that name should be very familiar. It's in pretty much every sensory textbook that you would take at a university level. Arthur D. Little was a mega consulting firm, the biggest and the first technical consulting firm in the United States, started by a guy named Arthur D. Little. And back in the 1940s, they developed the first descriptive sensory analysis method called the flavor profile method. Now, the idea to this method was we're going to take people and we're going to teach them how to describe what they smell and what they taste using, using objective terms based on reference standards and using a standard intensity scale. So the method itself is qualitative and quantitative. The thing it is not is subjective. It's very objective. It actually is the basis, this flavor profile method is the basis for all descriptive testing that's done in the world today. There are different methods. Europe has free choice profiling. There's quality dimensions analysis for the folks out in California. There's sensory spectrum work down in New Jersey. All of these methods are based on the flavor profile method. Um, it has analytical attributes. We measure single things like level of sweet flavor or level of grain taste. We also measure some very complicated interactive things like balance and fullness. Balance being harmony of flavor, fullness being complexity. Was introduced to the world as the first method through a society here in the United States called the American Society of Testing Materials. Um, Arthur D. Little actually set up a committee that still exists called E18 that writes sensory methods. It is a very powerful method. And over the years of using this method, Arthur D. Little began to see certain things. And those things helped them develop market-leading products. So Captain Crunch cereal was the first extruded cereal in the United States, very popular. Uh, Bud and Bud Light, the most successful beers in the world, even today, Bud Light is the number one beer in the world. Tropicana orange juice, using descriptive sensory, went from $6 million a year revenue to $600 million, simply by using the information that I'm going to show you uh, that we're understanding grains with now. Um, and then Dunkin' Donuts, which a lot of us know Dunkin' Donuts coffee and uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, donuts, uh, extended shelf life donut. Descriptive sensory analysis was used for those. I could give you hundreds more examples, but uh, hopefully you'll trust me that this approach is well proven and well understood. And the second part of it has to do with the interpretation of the results. 
And I'm, I'm taking some valuable minutes at the beginning of this webinar to go through this because when I get into the data with the wheat sourdough bread, I want you to understand why we have so much confidence in how we develop some of the interpretive tools like the quality index that I'm going to go over. And the reason we have so much confidence is that we have 40 years of history. And before that, before my time, there's another 40 years of history where all of the principles of what I'm going to talk about held true in the marketplace. So this is very powerful data. This is a good example. Arthur D. Little noticed over all those years of working with all kinds of food products, peanut butter and beer and orange juice and wine and toothpaste even, they noticed that certain things that became market leading products. And another, another way of saying that is certain things that people really liked because they would buy them over in the market had some things in common. And they labeled these the flavor leadership criteria. Now, the flavor leadership criteria are objective, descriptive, sensory attributes that we can train people to measure. And that's what we're doing. The first of these criteria is what we call aromatic identity. When you eat something, if you're eating a corn tortilla or you're eating a piece of bread, it should immediately taste like what you expect. And if it does, well, that has the potential to sell a lot in the market. It's a good thing. If there's a flavor lag and you don't get it right away, well, it doesn't have as much potential to be a, a market leading product. So when we start to talk to farmers or we talk to local producers, we say, look, whatever you're growing, whatever you're producing, whatever you're supplying, whatever you're making in your kitchen, you want it to result in a product that has this immediate impact of identifiable flavor that people that are going to eat or drink the product immediately say, oh, yeah, that's what I expected. That's what I have. The second criteria is what we call amplitude. Consumers in general like things that have harmony. They're not disjointed. Things don't stick out. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule we won't cover today. Things like spicy food where some people can't get enough spice. Um, things like sour foods. There are certain segments of the, the, the market out there. But in general, the big part of the population, if you look at what they prefer, say Coca-Cola versus Pepsi, they're looking for things that have more balance of flavor and more fullness of flavor, more complexity. Third criteria is mouthfeel. What we mean by that compatible mouthfeel. So if we're making, uh, if we're in the Netherlands and we're making fresh ground mustard, then it should have some sting, some irritation because that's compatible. But if we're making a, a winter wheat sourdough bread, we shouldn't have that sting because that's not compatible. It's not a compatible mouthfeel with what consumers would expect from their bread. The next category is pretty straightforward, and it's one that too many people focus on, which is I don't want any off flavors. It shouldn't taste soapy or metallic or any chemical or barney or anything that the, the end user is, doesn't expect. Um, and yeah, we do a good job of that, but it's only one of these five criteria. So we have to do an equally good job measuring all the other things. And then there's aftertaste, short, clean aftertaste um, drives market success. So let's keep all this in mind as we move forward now um, and start to think about the study that I'm using as an example of the power of descriptive sensory analysis in the world of grains. Now, one key thing that we have in our group up at UVM is a properly trained descriptive group. Now, these are folks that are staff within UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soils Program, to which, which I now uh, work under Heather Darby. Um, these tasters went through formal training sessions using lots of food products as, as training aids and ref, reference standards, chemical reference standards, and physical reference standards, and they get a lot of practice. Doing descriptive sensory analysis isn't rocket science. It's like playing a musical instrument. You need to practice, practice, practice to get good at it, and they do. Uh, this group now is working on a range of products. Um, as Alice mentioned, we've reported out on some of the grass-fed milk work. We've been using the descriptive panel as an instrument to develop this objective data for. We've got a big, big project going on right now with Artisan Cheese, where we're comparing the sensory characteristics with the microbes and the quality of the milk and the processing. We just finished up a, a Flint corn one where we were looking at tortillas and, and chips made with different varieties of Flint corn. And certainly we've been doing a lot of stuff in hops and beer, but now we we've, been able to dive into grains over the past couple of years through the work um, that we have on this big funded, USD funded study. 
And I want to jump into a part of that study, and this is just a part of that study. We call it the Northeast Winter Wheat Trial for 2022, and talk a little bit about how we use descriptive sensory analysis and what we found, what grains we were using, who were the bakers, and what did we find using this, and, and how we developed the quality index to help us interpret the data that we're getting to make quick decisions to guide the research, but also to give immediate feedback to, to the farmers, the people that want to grow these grains, uh, interested in growing these grains and which ones they might be interested in growing that might work better than others. You'll notice a lot of the photographs through the, the presentation from this point forward are photographs of either the bakers, and that's what this slide is showing, some of the bakers from King Arthur and Red Hen, uh, some of our team from New York is in this photograph, and, and some of the uh, them producing some of the breads that were in the, the bake trial that we had last year. So the first step in descriptive sensory analysis is training people. We call it calibrating the instrument because we're not getting subjective information. We need to make sure that everybody that's tasting knows how to smell and taste and describe things in a very standard way. And so they went through the, that intense program that I talked about earlier. Then when we start up a new product, we have a step that's called sensory orientation. And that's what this slide is referring to. So back in February of last year, um, we decided to use descriptive sensory as part of this big grain study. And UVM was asked to use their trained panelists. And we said, okay, well, let's get started. Let's orient ourselves to artisan bread. And so we run a sensory orientation session where we go out and we buy all different uh, samples, different types of artisan bread, and we sit down as a as a human instrument, a group of people that are highly trained, and we smell and taste all of these bread samples, and we talk about how we're going to describe what we smell and what we taste in objective terms, rather than saying, oh, this is my favorite, I like this, this one has a toasted to burnt grain character. This one has a yeasty sour. This has more of a lactic acid uh, milky sour. This has a vinegar sour. We come up with a set of terms that is specific for this category of products. Then what we do is we develop a score sheet. And it's called the Profile Analysis, uh, Attribute Analysis Score Sheet. And it's a combination of the information we learn by screening a bunch of different breads to understand the world of wheat sourdough bread and incorporating that previous knowledge from the flavor leadership criteria. And then we practice with that score sheet as much as we can to get ready for the actual bake trial. Now, the design for the test that I'm gonna go through was pretty straightforward. We had um, six bread samples. We were doing it blind. On this slide, I'm actually telling you what the varieties were, and I'll talk a little bit more about those on the next slide. But I want you to understand that the instrument works best, uh, just like any instrument in the lab, if it doesn't know anything about the samples. You just give it the sample and it tells you objectively, what does it smell like? What does it taste like? How does it feel? And so we didn't know what the, what the samples were. For our part of the study, we had bakers from King Arthur Bakery and Redhead Bakery up here in Vermont, uh, Randy George and Kerry and, and Jeffrey um, as part of the baking group. There were other bake trials going on simultaneously with this in New York and out in the Midwest and Wisconsin. For our study, we were getting bread from these two bake uh, organizations and, and these bakers, and it was good science. We had them bake us multiple loaves of bread, and then we did multiple replications of the lo those loaves uh, in a blind and random order fashion on our panel. So it was all really good science using those trained people and that score sheet I described earlier. Now, just to talk a little bit about the grain, uh, most of you out there, this is the thing that that I'm sure you find most interesting. Um, these were all from breeding trials that, that were going on, have been going on under this funded work for many years now. There have been multiple iterations of the projects from Julie, Julie and uh, Lucia out in Wisconsin. Um, the particular grains that we use for this bake test were all from an on-farm trial at Metal Arc in Wisconsin. And in fact, we asked Metal Arc to mill all the grain to make flour exactly the same process for all the samples so that we could re remove that as a variable. Um, in general, the grains that are being crossbred uh, in their program out there represent historic winter wheat varieties that are known uh, 
to be successful at making artisanal bread and for the quality of the bread. And I would point any of you that that really want more questions or have more questions and want more information about the breeding trials and all of the grains themselves, um, we can get you in contact with Julia, Lucia, or some of the people on our team that know more about the breeding trials and the grains themselves. Uh, warthog, it's just some examples of some of these. Warthog was one. It's it's a hard uh, red winter wheat. Um, excellent, excellent grain to use for this. Uh, you'll notice a lot of these are from France. I think Julie spent a lot of time in France and then at Cornell working with these types of grains. These are hardy winter uh, grains that have good um, properties for, for making bread with uh, the Maxine and, and the Guar as well, and then crossbreeding these with some other uh, types. This is the score sheet that we actually use for the study, and you'll notice it is an analytical score sheet. It's not something that's asking for an opinion. Um, total intensity aroma, when you smell the bread, how strong is the overall smell? We also collect words. What does it smell like? Total intensity of flavor. When I taste this bread, how strong is the flavor and what am I tasting? The attributes that are highlighted in red are the ones that we added to the score sheet that help us measure those very important flavor leadership criteria. They're going to help us interpret the data when we finish developing all of the detail using this, this highly sensitive human instrument. We measured the intensity of the grain, the toasted character. Was it raw grain, toasted or burnt? Um, sweet aromatics, things like, was there any sweet aromatic like a honey note or a bran note? Yeasty aromatics, was there yeasty sour? Were there any fresh bready notes, fresh yeasty notes? And then other sour, sour aromatics are things like, were there any uh, uh, acetic acid or vinegar type notes? Because this is a sourdough bread. Uh, were there any lactic notes? Um, salt, sour, and bitter are what we call basic taste on the tongue. We measure those using our taste buds. What level of salt flavor, sour, or bitter? Uh, salt and sour tend to be positives in this type of bread. Bitter tends to be a negative. Um, mouthfeel. Uh, the intensity, how dry is it? Do we get any sting? Others, is there anything in there that shouldn't be there? If so, how strong is it? Aftertaste, how strong is the aftertaste one minute after your last taste? These are all metrics that we know from, from years and years and hundreds of thousands of data points working with consumers that these are important things to measure to, to see if they're different between the samples. We also included texture attributes. And a quick note about texture, difference between mouthfeel and texture is mouthfeel, we're measuring how our mouth feels. My mouth is dry. Something is stinging in my mouth. Um, I'm salivating. I pucker. I have a thick feeling in the back of my throat. Anytime we measure something in the mouth, it's a mouthfeel. Anytime we describe the product, it becomes a texture. So if we say, well, that crust is very hard, it's a barrier. That crust is soft. It's more like just a membrane. Um, the bread seems very dense or it's very airy or the, the bread is very moist versus dry. All of those statements were describing the bread. And so they become texture notes. And we measured those as well. And then during this program, we ran a bunch of educational workshops for bakers and grain growers and researchers in New York and out in Wisconsin. And one of the feedbacks we got from the bakers especially were, you know, we really should add a couple of attributes. One we want to call flavor development. When I eat this piece of bread, how long does it take for me to really appreciate what it's given me, what the flavor is? And then first impression. Do I get what do I get what I expect right away? Or is there a little bit of a flavor lag? And it takes a few minutes to pick up what I want. And so we added those in as well because even though they didn't realize it at the time, they are describing components of the flavor leadership criteria that we know are important for consumer acceptance. So we had no problem adding them to our score sheet. Um, not gonna go much into intensity. There's a lot of debate about this out in the sensory world. We're using a seven point intensity scale. It actually was developed for Arthur D. Little by researchers at MIT, the school down in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's a very powerful way to measure the intensity of things, like the intensity of grain flavor or the intensity of sour that's coming from uh, the recipe or the intensity of an off note, because this is the way that, that the average person thinks. The average person thinks in terms of seven levels of intensity. That was the answer that came back from MIT back in the 1940s, and it has proven to be true for the last oh, 80 years. Um, and so we're using that same intensity scale. Now, when we 
give those samples to our panel, our descriptive sensory panel, and we do all those replications blind. We, you can imagine we develop a lot of data. And I'm not going to give you a huge data crunch here. I, I, some of you may be data people, other people not. You can let me know and I can provide whatever level of data you want. Um, but suffice it to say, we get a lot of detail, a lot of objective detail about the sourdough bread samples in this study. Um, and so what do we make of it all? Um, well, before we talk about any statistics, and I'm not going to get too much into statistics, there are some things as sensory professionals that we notice right off the bat. First of all, in this study, we had two samples that were controls that were just a repeat to see if the process worked. And those samples were labeled ERP and IKR. Um, that was the turkey red uh, flower that was used. And one of the things we notice right off the bat is when we start to look at average scores for each of those individual attributes we measured. So when you look at this table, total intensity aroma, total intensity flavor, balance, fullness, we see the numbers are pretty close. We're going to talk about 0.5 unit difference in a minute because that's a difference that we know is meaningful. Okay, So when we start to look at this data, even before we get into statistics and the science and the research and all of those things, and we take a practical view and say, okay, but what did we learn? Well, at this point, one thing we know for sure is the process is working because we had a repeat sample and we got the same data using blind testing, given the instrument, these samples, without telling them what they were, and it gave us this basically the same data back on a repeat set of samples. Now, the other thing we learned is when we look at the ranges of some of these attributes, we see ranges and average scores that exceed half a unit. And that becomes very important for us if we, if we really believe in all that previous sensory knowledge, because we know with a properly trained panel, so if our human instrument is calibrated correctly, and if we're using good science, meaning blind tasting, repeat, you know, re replicate analysis, on the sensory panel, then even before we do statistics, we can start to look for differences that matter. And what Arthur D. Little found over those many decades of working with all those market-leading products around the world is that any time the instrument records a difference of grade at 0.5 or greater, usually we say greater than 0.5, that's a meaningful difference. And what that means is that's a difference that is not only statistically significant, but it's a level of difference that would matter to the average person that might cause them to like one sample more than the other or might cause them to not like one sample more than another. So we put a lot of emphasis on this number 0.5. And at this point, before we even dive into the data, we can see that we've got a bunch of flavor attributes and a bunch of texture attributes where among the samples, we see a difference of greater than 0.5. And this is, this is great because now we know we're seeing some differences so that we can actually answer some questions in a meaningful way as we move forward with the data. Now, we do do statistics. I won't get too much into the statistics for, for the non-numerical people out there, but obviously we want to do good science. We want to have confidence in our abilities and our data and make sure that we can make statements. And we always want our meaningful interpretations to be statistically valid. Uh, typically, we'll run things like principal components analysis on the data to see, to see what's happening and see what kind of differences the data might be uh, telling us. For those of you who don't know what a PCA does, it basically um, helps us to understand if there are groups of characteristics that help to best explain differences between samples. So we can look at, okay, what was the difference between grain intensity or sour? And those are single dimension analytical things. But what a principal components analysis does is it says, okay, within these samples and the data we have, were there ways to group things together? Like the first principal components here says, well, fullness of flavor and grain intensity and toasted level seem to group together in a way that it helped to dif differentiate the samples. And that's what this does. One of the issues, though, is if you look at the bottom row in the table, uh, when that says cumulative, it's telling us how much of the information, how much of the differences we're seeing, does that dimension or that group of, of flavor characteristics help to explain? And you see it's only 32%. 
And if we add the next dimension, it, it goes to 47. And even if we go up to four different dimensions, we're only explaining 67% of the data, which tells us, you know what, these samples, we didn't see huge differences. Um, and this is going to help us from a, a research standpoint, but from a practical standpoint, we'd like to see more information explained with less dimensions. But we do it, and we do it for one primary reason, and that's to have confidence in the data. So what you see on this slide is what's called a flavor map. We're simply looking at that objective data was developed by the calibrated panel, the trained panel, and we are plotting out two of those statistical dimensions, one that involved the sweet aromatics and the grain and the grain intensity, and the other one involved yeast aromatics and sour. Um, and what we're looking for in particular is are the two samples in red, because using the data from, from the actual tasting and the analysis of that data, we want to make sure that those samples come out close or not different than each other because it's a repeat sample. It's a check of the process. And sure enough, we see that the repeat sample plots plots almost on top of each other. And that's a good result. It means the process is working. Now, beyond that, this isn't telling us much. You, some of you are sitting there saying, OK, I, I see a bunch of dots and a bunch of words. What is this really telling me? What's helpful here? either for the research team or for us out here that want to grow grow grain and, and figure out what's the best grain and what we're going to do with it. Um, this, this itself isn't as helpful. But what we can do is we can go back to that Arthur D. Little experience, and we can go back to all of that knowledge with all of those food products and not, not 50 or 100 or 200 data points, but hundreds of thousands of sensory data points. And what we saw happening over and over again. And what we saw is as we were using descriptive sensory on products like bread, on baked goods, on fried goods, on just about everything, we started to see that when we did the statistics, two of the dimensions that would always emerge that helped describe important differences between products were a dimension that we called quality, or sometimes you'll hear the word cleanness, and another dimension that's called identity or robustness. And these things would always emerge. And they'd always come out of that principal components analysis. And, and the certain attributes, especially the flavor leadership criteria attributes, would always be weighted pretty much the same way. And what happened at Arthur D. Little is we began to take advantage of that information and use those weighting factors on data sets where we weren't using the actual principal components from that small set of sample, but we were using the results from much bigger sets of samples to interpret and have meaning. So in this case, we used all of that learning from the last 40 years to develop a bread quality index. And you notice in the box that says from, it has some weighting factors, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.2 for a bitter. These are weighting factors that we would see over and over again when we did products like this in our studies. And so rather than using the smaller data set principal components that we saw earlier, we can develop a principal components index using all of this past work just to illustrate differences and help us make decisions. And so we have a quality index. Now we know that low numbers, which means more balanced flavor, not as much mouthfeel, not as much others are off flavor, not a lot of bitter on the tongue, and not a, a strong aftertaste. Those have been linked to things that consumers like more. So lower numbers on this quality index are a quote unquote good thing when we begin to interpret the data. The data itself is objective. We're simply going to plot the data. But as we begin to look at the data and where it falls on the maps, we can even at this point begin to predict what's good, what's bad in terms of what will consumers like more than, than something else. And this is a very, very strong approach. I mentioned some of the work earlier. We've, we've done this in grass-fed milk. We've done it in cheese. We've already done follow-up consumer testing. And these assumptions have held true like they have for the last 40 years. It is a very powerful way to look at this. Now, we also were able to develop an identity index. This one's a little trickier. Unlike the quality one, which is linear, we know that, that people like things that are more blended. They like things that don't have off flavors. When it comes to identity, which, which involves things like, well, how much flavor is there? How much of the different things I'm looking for is there? 
it doesn't tend to be as linear. There tends to be kind of, okay, that's enough that I'm happy and I want to eat it. Okay, now you've gone overboard. There's too much flavor and I can't eat as much. And so the identity index is one that we we do need and we plan to get more consumer information, but it does help us to see differences between the samples, even at this point. And so we use some of that past knowledge to develop the second powerful dimension, which we call identity. So now I just want to clarify, we're not plotting everything we learned about the breads. What we're plotting now are core sensory properties. These are things that we know will drive market success. We know these things are important to consumers. So even at this point, it will help us evaluate the grains from which uh, these breads were made. And it will help us to interpret it in a very meaningful way, in a very successful way, because we have so much history interpreting this kind of data. So now we end up with a flavor map that looks similar to the one earlier. That's a good thing. Means that we don't have to look deeper and say, wow, something unique is going on here, which, which we, we never see. Um, you can notice that the ERP and the IKR, which are the turkey reds, plot very close to each other. On these maps, that half unit is also applicable to index scores. So if things are within a half a unit, we say they may be a little bit different, but they're not different enough for the av average person to see. So the ERP and the IKR really are in that in that bucket. Um, we start to see some directional differences here with some of the grains. You can see the, the warthog and um, the, the breeding mixture, the warthog and the, the gua fall someplace slightly different on the map. And one thing that we know, because we know a lot about what goes into the quality index, is that if we went out and we tested these breads with average people, things that fall on the left side of that x-axis, the quality index, we would predict would be more liked by the average consumer. We have proven that over and over and over again. I can tell you we did a massive study for, for a company called Abbott Nutrition in Asia. It involved, North, involved Korea and Vietnam and Taiwan and China and Indonesia. And we applied all these principles. And then they went back the year after and did actual consumer testing. And everything was spot on. So this is pretty, pretty, um, pretty powerful stuff that we have a lot of confidence in. But think about what we have now. Even before we dive into all the detail, the data, which we're doing, um, we can make some decisions here. Because if a researcher says, look, we want to proceed with some of these the breeding trials, which ones at this point are looking more interesting? Well, we have data right now to say, well, look at this PSJ is looking really interesting. And these other ones, well, they scored a little bit higher on the on this quality index, which means not as high quality, because higher quality numbers are lower numbers that are more balanced, no bitter, no aftertaste. Now, just so you know, we are also, um, I don't have time to present all the data, but we're using these to also go into other issues. For example... <laughs> This, this output was one of our questions. We had uh, two bakers working on this trial, one at King Arthur and one at Red Hen, and they both supplied samples of bread made with the same flour using the same grains. And the controls all, you know, we didn't differentiate. But one thing that was interesting was we had one sample, which happened to be the warthog, that if you look on this map, one of the samples from Baker 2 fell way to the left, meaning it was it actually scored directionally the highest quality. And the other baker used the same flour, but the bread that resulted from their process actually ended up on the far right side of the, the graph, which means, in directionally speaking, lower quality, in fact, the lowest quality of the group. And so during the past year and during this bake trial, we're using this type of information to go back and correlate against certain things that happen and try to understand, okay, for that one sample, why did things happen? But these maps give us a very quick summary view to even raise those types of questions so that we can improve the process so that in, the, in, in subsequent baking trials, we can do an even better job of making sure whatever variation, whatever possible variation could be in the process, uh, we understand and, and manage so that we don't have it in future trials. So using this approach for the Northeast trial, what did we learn? Well, the first thing we learned is the process works. And we learned that doing statistical analysis on the actual data from the test itself, 
We also learned at it by applying some of those indexes from previous learning because we had one sample that was a repeat sample. And in all of the testing on all of the key metrics we were using, it scored the same um, and different than other samples in the study. So that was one thing we learned. Um, the second thing we learned was that there was one, one of the trials, the Rouge de Bordeaux Warthog uh, variety that had sensory properties that were, were similar in quality and not different than the turkey red. So that becomes, if turkey red is a control and is a target in any way, then that, that bread made with that grain becomes very interesting. And even at this point with that overview I just gave, we can make some very good directional statements about, well, that's one we wanna continue to, to look at and maybe do some things with that one to see if we can improve it even more. And then the third thing we learned is that the other ones, the warthog by itself and, and the uh, the Maxine Guar and the warthog Guar, well, they fell on a part of the map that, that when we do the interpretation, at this point, the bread that was made with those um, didn't have the sensory quality that the other varieties had. So if we have to make a choice and focus on some of the some of the varieties versus others, then maybe these are ones that we don't focus as much on now because they fell on that part of the map. And what we're in effect, what we're doing is we're giving very meaningful uh, guidance to the researchers and and to the farmers to some extent on what to be what to be trying. Um, based on what we expect to happen when someone makes a product and tries to sell it out in the market. And that's the power of what we did here and what we're doing. So what are the next steps? Well, I'll tell you that this week, we just finished up uh, using our trained panel, our descriptive sensory panel up at UVM, uh, tasting another group of grains. The flour was provided this time the bakers from Renhead and King Arthur got together and baked all the breads together. So we had a uh, every all the great minds working together to produce one set of samples, multiple loaves again, that they sent up to St. Albans and Burlington, where our panel resides in Vermont. And we did a similar um, panel design where we looked at these the bread made with these samples. We did blind replications presented in, in random order. Um, haven't really looked at that data because we just finished that on Tuesday night of this week. Um, so I haven't dived very deep into that. I can't share anything of that with you yet, but it's very interesting based on what we saw on panel. We felt overall that the breads this time around were higher quality. That was just the discussion after the panel, thinking about those quality, those objective things that we measure that we know align with quality. Um, there were baking trials just like last year going on in New York and other geographic locations. So we'll have lots of physical data, lots of data from the, the bakers. Um, and, and our group is going to use um, all the interpret, interpretive skills that we used in this case that we developed. So that quality index and the identity index, using all that past learning, we're going to apply to this data as well to make some statements and come to some quick conclusions to guide the researchers and the feedback to, um, to everybody out there in the listening audience today. Now, in addition to that, we absolutely have plans to actually take some bread um, and go out and test it with consumers to validate the assumptions that we keep making over all these years. And as I mentioned, we did that with the grass-fed milk. We did it with the cheese. Uh, we're going to do it here. And the expectation is that nothing's going to change than all those other hundreds of studies where it simply validates that the quality index that we're using is a good index and a good predictor of what will be more successful when it comes to uh, the end user. And so we have plans to do to do that as well. Um, one thing I haven't talked about because I've focused on our descriptive sensory work is that there are other factors that are affecting decisions on which grains to move forward with research and not. For example, all of the bakers have been taking great notes on which of the flowers were easier to work with and which ones resulted in bread that looked better um, or performed in some way that they define performance as better. So there's a bunch of data that's being generated by the bakers. Um, there's information at the farm level with Julie's group and the, the people that are actually out there on the, on the trial farms, um, collecting all the data about 
how they grow, how, you know, how sturdy are they, how resistant are they to certain things, what's going on. So there's lots of other data that will go into decisions um, that get fed back to farmers and produces on these different grain varieties and, and suggested ones for different applications. It's not just sensory, but coming from my world as a sensory guy, I, I very often tell people, well, from my world, it all begins and ends with the experience that the customer gets because we can manage all those other things. Something could be really easy to use to bake with, but if it doesn't result in something someone wants to buy and eat over and over again, well, we're going to fail. And it could be really easy to grow. It could be the easiest grain to grow. We can get the highest yield. We can get the best looking grain. But if the bread that it gets made with it doesn't have the sensory properties that people want to buy and use over and over again, we fail. So even though we have to take into all of those things become part of the bigger decisions, we really need to start and end with descriptive sensory analysis data and, and being able to understand what our target is and what's going to make us achieve sustained success, year-to-year -year success, like Coca-Cola has, like Tropicana Orange Juice has, like we want the artisan, you know, uh, winter wheat sourdough artisan bread to have. It's going to come down to what grains can we grow? How can we process those into a product that is consistent and meets the criteria for the customer? And how do we share that information back with, with farmers? So we are in the process of putting together outreach materials and sharing a lot more detail with many of you out there. You'll be seeing a lot more on the sensory side in this quality index and to end up with the big picture, we we are very confident, I am very confident, that we have another application for this powerful descriptive sensory tool, which is to use it to very quickly, you know, submit samples to the human instrument, the trained panel, get information that we can look at and make decisions, make very quick decisions and say, okay, does that data say something good happened? It's something that we're we're working toward that will give us success, or or do we need to choose something different? And we intend to use that moving forward, not just with the with the with the wheat, but we have other grains in this study and other grains going on in other studies that we're involved with. I mentioned we we just finished up some work with Flint corn. We're going to continue to work in that area, uh, but we are very excited that at least from a sensory standpoint, having access to this calibrated panel and designing experiments and executing experiments like the one I just showed you is going to result in information that's going to help most of you out there listening in answer some of the questions that you have. Now, I can answer anything about the sensory and overall stuff. If you have detailed questions about the breeding trials, we're going to point you toward Julie and, and the people that are on our team to do that. Um, if you're bakers out there and have questions about the standard recipe that was used and the challenges that the bakers felt, um, I could talk a little bit about that, but really we would point you toward some of the bakers in the Northeast here. Uh, the guys at King Arthur and Red Hen were very involved in discussions with the bakers from New York and Wisconsin in dealing with all of those issues. And we would we would send you off to them to uh, to ask your detailed questions about the baking. But Alice, I'll open it up now for people listening that have other questions that I might be able to answer. Um, okay, we've got some questions coming in here. Um, here's a good one. Can you talk a bit about the concept of the average consumer? A lot of mar marketing advice to organic farmers focuses on developing niche markets like foodies or chefs, for instance. Would you recommend a preference for identity over quality to better reach a niche market? Or is the average consumer concept as applicable to a niche market as it is to a general audience who may be focused on value rather than taste? Great question. I, I put my thumbs up for this because as I was looking through as you were talking, I my eyes came to this one, and I love the fact that someone asked this question. This is an extremely important question. Whenever we look at um, at a product out in the market, there is always flavor segmentation, and there is always a big segment, like in beer, right? There's always the people that want to drink Budweiser and Miller and Heineken, and then there are niche segments, people that want microbrew or sour beers or something else. It's true in every product category. It's true for sourdough bread. And so the question becomes, how does all of what I just talked about work or don't work in that arena? And it goes to this question. What about niche products? What about the smaller markets? 
The first answer is the flavor leadership criteria work within a flavor segment. So if you have products within a niche market, call it an art, artisan sourdough wheat bread, within that segment and the characteristics that the bread have, the samples that better meet the flavor leadership criteria are going to be the ones that are more liked within that small segment. So the flavor leadership criteria, we've seen this over and over again. They don't just work for the mainstream part, the big set of segments that say, well, we want just kind of flavor, but general flavor, mass marketing. But when we get into those niche categories, the flavor leadership hold true and, in fact, become even more important. Because very often the niche segments are the ones that people that work in the industry will say they have more character. They have more flavor. They have more something. And consumers go to those niche, niche, niche uh, segments, A, sometimes for non-sensory reasons, it has a good story, it's locally grown, it's new and exciting, it's whatever. But once they start trying product in there, they're looking for something different, and that's why it's a different flavor segment. But then once they, once they get those two things met, it meets the story, it's something different, what are they going to choose within that niche? They're going to choose the thing that's more balanced in flavor of the group. They're going to choose the one that has the complexity they want. They're going to choose the one that has the least amount of off flavor that they're the, the flavor that they're not expecting. So it absolutely still applies. In fact, I would argue that where the stakes are higher in the smaller segments, in a lot of ways, it's even more important to be able to apply what I just showed you. And yes, it all does apply. And yes, it's predictive. And yes, we've tested it and it holds true. And yes, we're going to test it with these breads within the artisan community. I mentioned cheese. You know, we went out and uh, we did a lot of this testing and everybody loves cabbage cheese in Vermont. And and even people that say, I, I eat a lot of artisan cheese. They love, you know, the mainstream cheese. But then when we, when we start to focus in on users to say, look, I really only eat artisan cheese. Well, within that group, it's the ones that better met these flavor leadership criteria that they liked more. And we showed it again, and we had predicted it on the map. So great question, but yes, it does all apply. What doesn't apply is when marketing people tell you, I'm not a marketing guy, I'm a sensory guy, but I deal with heads of marketing around the world all the time. And they'll tell you, well, listen, um, it it just, you need to have this unique flavor and, and people will want to buy it because that's what they're asking for now, that unique flavor. The problem is that there's going to be more than one, one group out there, more than one company that's trying to provide that unique flavor. So now people that are buying those products have to choose it on something else. And that's what we're focused on, is that something else. It's once we understand that segment, which is a different type of work, how do we produce the, be the best products in that segment to meet consumer needs? So thank you for that question. That was great. And, and if I left you more confused, feel free to reach out to me and I will be glad to hop on a call or send you more information. Okay, great. Um, okay, so here's just a question about um, whether or not the X in the grain designations are cross breedings or mixes of flour. I think they are cross breed. Is that correct, Roy? Yes. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how many people do you, per, how many participants do you recommend being on a sensory panel? That is a great, great question. If, if you read, it depends on level of training and level of experience. If you don't get as much training and you don't do it very often, you need more people. In general, if you're using a properly trained descriptive sensory analysis panel, like the ones that Arthur D. D. Little developed, like the one we have at UVM, highly trained people, we need four to six people per panel. That's the number of people because they're highly trained, because they spend a lot of time with reference standards. And, and in fact, we see even within those four to six people, very little difference. The data is very consistent. We could probably get away with two or three people, but we like to have a few more. Um, that's different than if you're using QDA or using Spectrum or some of the other methodologies out there where the numbers are more like 15, 20, 25 more people. Uh, free, choice, free choice profiling over in Europe, they use a, a lot more people. But for the type of work you're seeing here, we're having panels that... Uh, are usually four to six people, four to six highly trained people. Okay. Um, is it possible for an individual farmer to get their wheat tested? And um, if so, who would do this? Well, the question, um, 
I'm assuming that whoever asked the question means get sensory tested. Yeah. Um, well, here's the difficulty. We are trying to develop. I, one of my goals is trying to def- develop some on-farm sensory testing to actually make some assessments about quality even before you make products with them. Uh, up until this point, they really don't work that well. So what you what you really need to do, whether you you make grain for bread or beer or 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 you're growing grain to make tortillas, you really have to have someone make the final product and then do sensory analysis on that final product. It really is the best way to assess quality. Um, you know, we we did stuff with the flint corn. We've done some stuff with this wheat where we're we're crushing it up, we're wetting it, we're smelling it, we're tasting it, and trying to correlate that against the final result. Um, and it and it doesn't seem to give us really good information. So so really the only choice, and this is now a barrier that we have to address and overcome for the person that asked that question, the, the best thing would say, well, who can I give my grain to to brew to make some bread with or make some beer with or do something with? And then who can I get to taste that to tell me if my if my grain worked well and ended up in a product that has the sensory properties? And right now, I think um, the groups that are doing uh, groups like the the collaborators on this team that are, you know, doing that, we've with the cheese and the the milk work we're doing, we are absolutely collecting samples from farms and giving them feedback after we use them in the study on how their things went. But um, unfortunately, there's no easy, good answer that I can point you to, to just say, okay, send your sample here and they can tell you what the sensory quality is gonna be when it gets used for something. Okay, um, let's see, here's a pretty technical question. Okay, they were, the, the person was saying, we go, yeah, so Jane, thank you for that. We grow in the Texas panhandle and it goes to Mexican bakeries. Any connection to what you're doing? Um. No, no connection on this work that we're talking about. I can tell you that uh, my Spanish is pretty good these days. I spent a lot of time in Mexico over my 40 years. And uh, when we deal in the Mexican market, in fact, when we deal in every market in the world, the same principles I talked about in this study hold true. So I don't have direct knowledge of the bakers that, that you're dealing with. I will tell you that people who say, well, people around the world have different preferences, they are more similar than you think. They are dead on similar when it comes to these flavor leadership criteria. People in Mexico feel the same way. If we were to test these artisan breads on in Mexico, we would get the same relative levels of overall liking that we would expect here in the U.S. Um, are there some local preferences? Yeah, there are. I mean, you know, certain spice things and certain other things. But for core drivers of success, which these are, uh, we see very little difference. I apologize. I wish I knew more about the Mexican bakers and about that uh, research that's being done there. It's not part of our current research here uh, on this project. And uh, and I haven't worked on with any of the private companies um, that might be involved in the work that you're involved with. Okay, here's a question about your data. Is there a correlation between your MIT intensity scale, zero to seven, versus the 10 to 15 centimeter line scale? scale length intensity scale? Well, I'll answer it this way. Um, the, the the intensity scale that Arthur the Little developed came out of a very simple question. Okay. So back in the 1940s, Arthur D. Little went to MIT and then went to MIT because Arthur D. Little himself was an MIT chemical engineer that started the company. And they asked MIT a very simple question. They said, how many levels of intensity can an average person consistently measure and differentiate? And so MIT did a bunch of work with people and they came back with two answers. They said, look, if you can put all the samples in front of you and cross compare, the best that you can consistently measure are 15 levels of intensity. However, if you do that exercise and then remove all the samples and you give someone one sample at a time, the best that we can consistently measure are seven levels of intensity. Trying to measure anything beyond seven levels reduces our precision, reduces our consistency, because that's the best that the human mind can remember, are seven levels of intensity. So I know that we've got line scales. I know that people that love the metric system want to go to 10 points. I know that people in the food industry get frustrated with seven points because they, they say, oh, we can do more. We, there's not enough points. But the problem is when you look at the data, and we've done this for years and years and years, we've done this, we've continuously looked at it, 
consistency in the data goes down when you try to measure more than seven points. So yeah, you can do it with 10 or 15 points. You're not going to be as consistent with that data as you will if you're using seven points. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we have a couple questions here from people asking about whether the grains were grown regeneratively with no-till cover crops, animal rotations, et cetera. I think there was some variety of um, different practices, but these grains were all grown organically. Is that correct? I believe so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is true. And I would point uh, people either in the direction of Mark Sorrell up at Cornell or even better to Julie and her group out in Wisconsin to ask those types of questions. Yeah, many of these were grown at land grant university um, research stations. Um, yep. So yeah, um, and you know they use a variety of different organic practices. So you know very likely including cover crops and in some cases animal rotation. But I'm not sure how many. So I think there was some variation there. Um, Let's see, I'm just trying to go down and see. Let's see, here's a question. If we're talking about average consumer and niche segment, does that does regeneratively grown wheat fall into that? I think when um, the discussion of average consumer and niche segment was more about the sensory qualities, is that correct? Rather than the way um, the yeah, product was grown. Yeah, because th things that fall in niche categories can fall in there for a bunch of reasons. And I'm sure that some of the way that the grain is grown might result in it, it resulting in end products that are more mainstream versus niche. Um, I don't know the connection there. Um, maybe some other folks on the team would know it. But certainly, no matter how they get in that niche, as I said earlier, the the principles and the sensory stuff that I've been talking about still applies in that niche category as it does in the mainstream, whether it got there because of the regenerative way it was grown or or uh, however it ended up in that final product being in that niche category. Okay. Um, let's see. Is there any work going to be done um, with bread using ancient grains? I know we have a variety of webinars um, in our archive about um, ancient grains and baking with them, um, but I don't know if you've done any work with those, Roy. I, I have not, and I'm getting excited thinking about that because it would be great. I am sure that you know Heather and June and Julie and Mark and all the people on our team probably either are involved in some of that work or are thinking about doing that work. I have not been in discussion yet as far as using this capability to uh, to look at products made with ancient grades. I would hope that that would be something that would be part of our mix of things to look at in the future. Um, I, I think it's another great application. And, and when I say great application, because we haven't really applied all of this great knowledge to those to those subjects yet. And we need to. But I did want to mention that we do have some archived webinars um, on um, einkorn, emmer, and spelt, and those ancient grains and the production and baking with those and dehulling as well um, on our website that are linked to the website that I put in our chat box, um, which is um, the Value Added Grains for Local and Regional Food Systems website. So the address is eorganic.info slash value added grains. So um, if you're interested in that, subject, um, you might be able to find some information in some of those recordings. There's a comment out here. They're out in Washington State where there's similar work happening with grains. And uh, thanks very much for the information. So yeah, I know they do a lot of great work out in Washington at the Bread Lab um, with with grain baking, with whole grain baking. So yeah, and I'm I'm looking forward to more robust discussion with those folks and and uh, you folks up in Oregon and folks out uh, west. We've we have a lot of discussions between you know Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and us in New England and New York um, on the sensory side of things, and uh, I'm looking forward to expanding that. So anybody that wants to get in touch with me and email me or call me and have discussions, I would love to to meet all of you and and answer questions and toss around ideas together.